Let's begin with prayer. Father God, what an amazing, what an amazing opportunity to come before you. Thank you for Christ our Lord, that we have been justified by faith in Christ. We have been set free from our sins. We have a hope in heaven. And Lord, we get to worship and know you. Holy, holy, holy are you, for you are good and you are God. Let your spirit cover us and teach us. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, have you heard of stupid criminals? Yes. Yes. They're kind of fun. You know, I have, a, I, have, I have a few here where you just shake your head. This one actually made me fall out of my desk. I laughed so hard when I read it. Joey Miller and Matthew McNally, these men were behind likely the worst and least thought out disguises in the history of crime. When committing their misdeed, they didn't use masks or hoods to cover themselves when they robbed the bank. Uh, which would be typical of most criminals when you were to, if you want to hide your disguise. But instead of, of using a mask or whatever, they chose to pay, draw on their faces with permanent markers. <laughs> you know, while it may be hard to have recognized them during the crime, permanent marker is, as the name suggests, notoriously hard to remove, which left the man extremely easy to identify. Hmm, I wonder if you were the guy. No, I have no idea what you're talking about. The dumb stun, or in the deal with the nickname Dumb and Dumber. <laughs> Ruben Zarat, in 2008, an 18-year-old man named Ruben attempted to rob a muffler shop in Chicago. After demanding the money, he was told that most of the cash was stored in the safe that could only be opened by the manager who wasn't scheduled to come in until a few hours later. To save himself from trouble, Zarat left his cell phone number for the store to call him back once the manager came in <laughs> so that they could call him and say, the manager's here, you can come rob the store. <laughs> of course, you know how that turned out. They called the police, then they called him back, and he was arrested. In a similar one, Albert Bailey in 2010, Bailey and his accomplice decided to rob a bank in Fairfield, Connecticut. But in an attempt to speed up the process of the crime, Bailey called the bank in advance to let them know, I'm coming to rob you. His obvious intent was to give the bank plenty of time to put the money in the bag, so all he had to do was drive up, put the bags in his car, and be on his way. You know, these criminals just are not the same hardened criminals that we once had, you know. Just so lazy. <laughs> of course, they uh, called the authorities and were waiting for him when he arrived. I mention these stories of dumb criminals because of the first verse in the passage that we're studying today. It's actually a question, 3 verse 8. It's a question that says, will a man rob God? You know, that is the dumbest of all acts of crime, if you ask me. Will a man rob God? Because can you really rob God? Can you really get away with what you're robbing him from? Can you really get away from God and the sins that you've committed? Scripture teaches us who God is. And in the book of Hebrews, we read this verse, For the word of God is living and active and sharper than any two-edged sword, and piercing as far as the division of soul and spirit, of both joints and marrow, and able to judge the thoughts and intentions of the heart. And there is no creature hidden from his sight, but all things are open and laid bare to the eyes of him with whom we have to do. In verse 12, you'll notice it said we, that uh, we read that our thoughts and our intentions are known. Okay? Not just what we do, but our thoughts and our intentions. This means what are you thinking and what you intend to do, even if you don't do it. He sees that. And so we come, we come clean to God. God, I'm a sinner. I need you. You can't rob God. In verse 13, it says that, we, that nothing is hidden from God. We're an open book. There's no way he can be deceived or tricked. He sees it all. He sees your heart and your actions. In Psalm 139, the psalmist wrote, O Lord, you have searched me and known me. You, have, you know when I sit down and when I rise up. You understand my thoughts, thought from afar. You scrutinize my path and my lying down and are intimately acquainted with all my ways. Even before there's a word on my tongue, behold, O Lord, you know it all. Our God is intimately aware 
of who we are, what we think, and what we do and have done. Yet he loves us still. He still loves us. And his love covers us. His love is not taken away. He knows what you're thinking. (laughs) And he loves you. And he says, I'm here to redeem you and save you and take you to be with me because I love you. When we think of God's knowledge, it's both comforting and frightening. His knowledge of us is an act of love, though. What he knows reveals his love. He comes after you to invite you into his presence and into his loving arms. He wants you to know that through and because of Christ, he has forgiven you. He has saved you. He's redeemed you. He has sanctified you. And he has prepared a home for you to live with him. You come before him and just repent of your sins, and he will forgive you. He did this because of the cross and accomplished it. What we need to know about God is that he's the creator of heaven and earth. He is the creator which makes him sovereign and Lord, which proves that we are accountable to him. He created us in his image. With that, we are to act a certain way and live in a certain manner. He created us to know him, love him, and serve him. And not serve him like, you know, some king, you know, where they're doing the palm branches and feeding them grapes, you know. None of that, you know. What would he need from us in that regard, right? It means that we are to love him. And when we love him, we love others. To live as he is. To reveal his character and how, he a- and how we act. To honor him and what we say. Our God is in heaven, said the psalmist in 115. And he does whatever pleases him. And what does he do? What pleases him? He loves. He is generous. He gives. He is compassionate. We are, to, we are to be the same way, to love, to be generous, to be compassionate. We're to act with generosity and live compassionately. He's not asking us to give him something because he's lacking something, but rather to live in the character that he has revealed within us and to us. He's calling us to a lifestyle of Christ. Let Christ live his life in and through you. Give to God your very life. Surrender to him. Worship him. Love him. Honor him. Know him. So I challenge us today. Surrender. Surrender your life to him. Surrender everything to him. He's worth it. Surrender your life to him. Surrender your heart, your mind, your will. Hold nothing back. For when you do, his character will flow through you. He he will provide for you. He will guide you. His love will fill you up and flow out of you. He knows what is best for you. He knows what is good. He knows you. Surrender. Let his grace be known through you and in you and cover you. As we continue our study in Malachi, where in chapter 3, we find that the people of God, the remnant, have lived in the land uh, for over 100 years. Previous to their return to, to the land, they were exiled from the promised land to Babylon because they were idolaters. They were steeped in idolatry. They worshipped all sorts of false gods and foreign gods. They had bowed their knee willingly without any sort of a fight, without any sort of anything. They just simply worshipped any god that was there. And so they lived in exile. God kicked them out of the land, and they lived in a foreign country. And Psalm 137 is what's known as an exile psalm, and, and this is how they felt. By the rivers of Babylon, there we sat down and wept. And when we remembered Zion, they were distraught. They had lost their home. They were lost everything. They were most likely treated with contempt as a defeated people. According to Esther, Haman tried to annihilate them. If you read through that book. According to Daniel, God revealed himself mighty to the nation of Babylon. In fact, Daniel's testimony of God was so amazing that it turned Nebuchadnezzar's heart. It's a powerful picture of that. And finally, after many decades, King Cyrus, so there was Babylon, and then they got defeated by the Persians, all right? Persians and the Medes, if you will. And so it was no longer Babylon in control, but the Persians and the Medes. And so Cyrus was what, uh, one of the, fir- with the first king of Persia, and he made a declaration, and, and it should be on your screen. It says, The Lord, the God of heaven, has given me all the kingdoms of the earth, and he has appointed me to build him a house in Jerusalem, which is in Judah. Whoever there is among you of all his people, may the Lord his God be with him and let him go up. And so here's Cyrus, a foreign king, doesn't know God, never been taught who God is. God speaks into his heart, and Cyrus says, all those who have, uh, are Jews that want to go back to Jerusalem and build a temple, go. 
I'll let you go. I, I'll give you whatever you need. God did that. You know, in Second Chronicles, where we read, it says that God stirred the heart of Cyrus, which caused him to make this proclamation. God did this. What we see in that statement is God's faithfulness to his people. He did not give up on them. That no nation, no matter how powerful, can stop God's will from happening. He will bring his people back. He will fulfill his words. So honor God. Surrender your life to him. He is faithful. So number one, God seeks to reveal himself in us. Let's take a look at Malachi 3. We'll look at verses 8 through 10. Will a man rob God, yet you're robbing me? But you say, how have we robbed you? In tithes and offerings. You are cursed with a curse, for you are robbing me, the whole nation of you. Bring the whole tithe in the storehouse, so that there may be food in my house. And test me now in this, says the Lord of hosts, if it will not open for you the windows of heaven and pour out for you a blessing until it overflows. Churches in the northeastern Indian state of Mizoram have a beautiful phrase to express what, the way they give unto God. Uh, I can't really say it, so. It means, though, one handful of rice at a time. Here's how it works. Families in the church will set aside a portion of rice each and er at every meal for God. And when they collect enough rice, they donate it to their local church. The church will then take that rice and sell it uh, to generate income. In 1914, they used the sale of rice to raise $1.50, which is a lot more than it is today. But lately, these Christians, currently in today's time, they are collecting $1.5 million as they support 1,800 missionaries in addition to local ministries. People have also started to give in more creative ways, vegetables, firewood, other resources, just so they can do whatever they can to raise money to support the gospel work that's going on around the world. One church leader said, there are many ways of serving the Lord. Some people do great things. Some people are great preachers. Some people contribute lots and lots of money. But when we talk about is this handful of rice, it's very humble. The service is done in the corner of the kitchen where nobody sees, but God knows, and he blesses it. Another church member said, it's not our richness or our poverty that makes us serve the Lord, but our willingness. So we Mizo people say, as long as we have something to eat every day, we have something to give to God every day. And notice it has nothing to do with, with the amount of money, but the heart. God, I give you my heart. That's what he's looking for. God is most seen in us when we love each other and the generosity of our lifestyle and through the compassion that we engage in. And God is honored in us when his character is revealed in and through us. It begins through, though, recognizing that he is our God, he is our creator, and he is our savior. Here in Malachi, God is upset with his people for their lack of focus on him and their lack of honoring him. God is not important to his people. As you read through this book, you can see that. He's not important to them, and therefore their society is breaking down. Their relationships are falling apart. The people, when told about the sacrificial system, are bringing God their worst and certainly not their best. You know, they, they're told to bring the best animal for sacrifice. Instead, they're bringing the worst animals, the crippled, sickly, and deformed animals. Who would want that animal? They cannot keep that animal to have a robust and strong flock. It doesn't cost them anything. So God isn't worth anything to them. And God called his people to bring in the best. Why? To show that they trusted him. If you give me your best, do you not trust me that I will give you my best and give you what you need? You see, if I bring the best to God, I'm saying to God, you're sovereign and watching over me. I trust you. The priests who were in charge of the sacrifices were accepting these sacrifices without saying a word. They didn't, they didn't care. And then these priests were also teaching the word, but partially. They were not teaching the whole counsel of God. They showed partiality in their teaching. And they caused people to stumble over the word of God instead of how to live out the word of God. You know, it's interesting. Malachi, you take this out and say, boy, this is today. You know, it's like ripping it out of the newspaper. <laughs> they did not want to offend, so they blend. I like that. We learned that in Sunday school last week. Don't offend, blend. You know, just take it all in and say, oh, you believe that? Just throw that in there. No. Teach the Word of God. No Christ. They blended the thoughts and attitudes of the people into the Word of God, hiding the authority of God's Word. 
The men in society were leaving their wives and marrying foreign women so they could participate in the immorality of the foreign gods. The society did not put God on the, in the center. And of course, if, they do, if you don't put God in the center of your community and your family, what happens is you will follow your deceitful desires. And let me tell you, that will lead you astray. Their society certainly did not reflect on the nature of God, but rather the character of the other nations. In verse 5 of last week, we, we looked at this verse. It says, Then I will draw near to you for judgment, and I will be a swift witness against the sorcerers, against the adulterers, and against those who swore falsely, against those who oppress the wage earner and his wages, the widow and the orphan, and those who turn aside the alien and do not fear me, says the Lord of hosts. You see how the word of God was replaced by another word with these sorcerers and wizards? Adultery and lying became the norm. Greed exalted and those low and destitute were forgotten and taken advantage of. It makes no sense that people did not take to heart. It would make sense then, based on what we're reading here, that these people did not take to heart their tithing or their giving or their loving unto God. They, the neglect of God was growing. Their complacency sharpened. Their dedication waned. Let us be careful to focus our lives on God and center Him in our lives. Live out His word and love Him deeply. Let us surrender unto Him everything, for He is God. Number one, God is able. God looks at His people and asks them, Will a man rob God? You can rob Him, but He sees what you're doing. There's another question in Jeremiah that asks another silly question. Can man make gods himself? <laughs> yet we do. <laughs> but they're not gods. Yet they're not gods. God can do the impossible. We cannot. Jeremiah again says, do not learn the way of the nations. For the customs of the people are delusion. There's none like you, O Lord. You're great, and a great is your name and might. There's none like you, God. You alone are God. When we, what we read in Jeremiah is how we are to live each day. Do not follow after the direction of the nations. Do not follow after your heart. Follow after God and his heart and his will. Will a man rob God? God then told his people, you're robbing me. How are we robbing you, God? And the people ask, you know, they ask this, how are we robbing you? See, they don't even know. And if they don't know, that means they don't care. Because God's not, they're not focused on Him. They're not thinking of Him. They would know. God is not their focus, and they're ignorant of God's word and character. And God tells them, you're robbing me, the tithes and offerings. You're dishonoring me. You have no, you're not, you're taking away my honor. When you do not give in to God, you're saying you're the owner of everything of your life. And you're saying God is not able to provide for me. I have to make sure I keep what I have in order to preserve my life, God, because you can't do it. I have to think of myself and not what his word says if I'm the owner. In First, in first Chronicles, David said this, But who am I and who are my people that we should be able to offer as generously as this? For all things come from you and from your own hand. From your hand we have given to you. <laughs> it comes from you anyway, whatever we have. Whatever we have, you gave it to us. We don't own it. God owns it all. We are the stewards of what God has given us. We're not the owners, but the stewards. Our very lives belong to him. The breath that you breathe belongs to him. Every time you breathe, thank you, God, for that breath. Thank you, God. It was his. This is why we surrender. We are giving to God what belongs to him, but we're acknowledging and recognizing his lordship. Lord, you are Lord. When God is not the focus, self then becomes the focus. And what happens when self becomes the focus? There's a curse. The curse is discontent and dissatisfaction. You will not be satisfied. He says, you are cursed with a curse. You're robbing me, the whole nation of you. Bring the whole tithe into the storehouse. You will never be content when self is on the throne. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. That's contentment. I shall not want. That's contentment. In Micah, we read this, you will eat, but you will not be satisfied, and your vileness will be in your midst. You will try to remove for safekeeping, but you will not preserve anything. And what you do preserve, I will give to the sword. You will sow, but you will not reap. You will tread the olive, but you will not anoint yourself with oil. And the grapes, but you will not drink wine. 
thankfulness and gratitude will be far from you when, thank, when self is on the throne. Self must not be on the throne. There will never be enough. When you tithe, you're saying to God, God, you are God. You're able to provide for me. You are able to care for me. I am content because you're my God. I'm content with what you've given me. I'm content with all that you have given me. When you trust God, fear goes away. You do not have to fear, for God is able. So surrender to him. Number two, God is trustworthy. You know, when Jesus was tempted by the enemy in Matthew 4, also Luke 4, you read this, the enemy said, jump off the temple and the angels will catch you. You know, do a backflip and land safely. And Jesus, of course, said, or Jesus said to him, do not put the Lord your God to the test. But, we're, you know, do not put the Lord your God to the test. Now, Malachi, the Lord says, test me in this. What is that we're testing the Lord in? In our giving. Bring the whole tithe. You see, when you realize that God owns it all, you ask him how much he wants you to give. How much he wants you to give. You say, Lord, what do you want me to give? He will then tell you what to give. If you don't know, then start with 10%. When you tithe, you acknowledge that God is able and capable to provide for you. God has revealed himself and continues to reveal himself as provider. His faithfulness is rooted in that. He does not change. He does not give up. He gives and he loves to give and provide. As I look at this passage, the people were robbing God because they were seeing their lives based on what they had instead of the God they know. They saw what they had, and they could not give it up. They could not let go. They could not relinquish control. When you hand over to God, over to God, your life, your possessions, everything, you're free. You're free, and you know that he will provide and take care of you. God told his people, when you give to me by trusting, by knowing you are the the steward and God is the owner, then God will provide. He said, I will open the windows of heaven. I will, uh, I will make sure you have all that you need. Even Jesus said in Matthew 6, but seek first his kingdom and his righteousness and all these things will be added to you. What are all these things? All that you need. All that you need, clothes, shelter, food. In Matthew 6, Jesus told his disciples, people make their needs their priorities. But you're to make God your priority. And when you make God your priority, you'll be given all that you need. Do you believe this? Is this, is God, boy, that was scary. I will give. No. <laughs> Do we believe this, though? God is capable of doing this for us and watching over us? He is. If he is the creator of heaven and earth. If he's intimately aware of your thoughts and your mind, as it says in, Jer in, in Psalm 139, he's able to watch over and care for you. Malachi 3.6, we're told that God does not change. The God you read about in this book is the same God today. The God who loves you yesterday is the God who loves you today. Our God is the same yesterday, today, tomorrow, and forever. Place your life in his hand, and, and, and it's the surest and most confident thing we can do. Surrender to him. Number two, God seeks within us the authentic witness. Let's look at 11 and 12. It should be 3, 11 and 12. Then I will rebuke the devourer for you so that it will not destroy the fruits of the ground, nor will your vine in the field cast its grapes, says the Lord of hosts. All the nations will call you blessed, for you shall be a delightful land, says the Lord of hosts. You know, in 1 Kings, before Solomon dies, he followed after, he had been living a life of wisdom, he had given his life to God, and then he married too many women, and these many women came from foreign nations, and they turned his heart against God. And he began to worship false gods. And at the end of his life, and here's someone that was supposed to be the wisest man, at the end of his life, he worships all these false gods. And God was very angry, he says, I will punish the nation, because he has worshipped false gods. So he, got, he finds this man, God calls this man named Jeroboam, and he's going to give Jeroboam ten tribes to the north, and Solomon's sons will have the tribes in the south. And so we have Israel in the north and Judah in the south. And so a prophet comes to Jeroboam, and he says this to Jeroboam, 
I will take you and you shall reign over whatever you desire and you shall be king over Israel. Then it will be that if you listen to all that I command you and walk in my ways and do what is right in my sight by observing my statutes and my commandments as my servant David did, then, you will be with, then I will be with you and build you an enduring house I built for David and I will give, you, and I will give Israel to you. So God promised Jeroboam a nation. A nation. He says, I will give this to you. He promised it. Now, when God makes a promise, he promised him a name and an identity. God gave him the land and the people to rule on one condition. Worship me. Surrender to me. One day, though, while Jeroboam was sitting in his office, he remembered there was that command. It says, we need all the men to go to Jerusalem three times a year to give me and to sacrifice and worship me. And he started to think, you know, if I send those men down there, they're going to say, why are we separated? We should just have one nation. Rehoboam is our king, not this other guy. And they'll kill me. You see what happened to Jeroboam? He began to own what God gave him. And what happened? Fear entered his heart. And immediately he says, let's create gods. He created these golden calves, put one in the southern end and the northern end of the kingdom, and says, these are your gods, worship them. Idolatry began. Because he began to say, this is mine. It was never yours to begin with. It was always God's. And the minute you have that, that fear enters your heart, because you got to keep it. My job is to obey. God will provide. The question we have to ask ourselves is, will we come through? Will we trust? Will we obey? Will we surrender? Because we know God will come through. So number one, God is for the whole world. God gave his promise to his people. I will rebuke the devourer. There you read there, verse 11. And the devourer refers to locusts or invading armies. And when you planted your crops and you saw a cloud of locusts coming, you knew that destruction of your crops was imminent. I mean, there was nothing you could do either. You know, that was your, for your food in the winter. Where are you going to go? There's no supermarket. If they destroyed the crops, that's it. That was your livelihood. That was fear and a threat. But is God capable of keeping and guarding against fear? Our God removes our fear. We can trust Him. God will protect what we need when we put Him first. Make Him your priority. Live out your life following Him. No one can serve two masters. Either He will hate the one and love the other, for no one can serve God and self at the same time. When God asked, will a man rob God, he said, you're robbing me of worship that is due my name. You're robbing the people of the earth the opportunity to know me. You are hiding my character and the world cannot see me. When you trust God, when you surrender to him, you love and honor him, you reveal his character and you make him known so other people can say, there's the God I need. You never hold on to what God has given you, but you trust him to hold it. If I trust God to hold what I've given him, who can rob God? <laughs> who can take from God? But if, you, if I hold it, boy, who can rob me? God looked at his people and said, all the nations will call me blessed. We have read of this. If you look at chapter 1, verse 5, it says this. Your eyes will see this and say, the Lord be magnified beyond the border, uh, border of Israel. In verse 11, it says, For the, From the rising of the sun even to its setting, my name will be great among the nations, and in every place incense is going to be offered to my name, and a grain offering that is pure. For my name will be great among the nations, says the Lord of hosts. In verse 14 of chapter 1, it says, But cursed be the swindler who has, made, who has a male in his flock and vows it, but sacrifices a blemished animal to the Lord. For I am a great king, says the Lord of hosts, and my name is feared among the nations. God is for the whole world. Instead of his people having... Uh, honoring God and loving God and revealing the God that they knew and trusted. They profaned his name, and now his name is covered in sin and greed and selfishness, and the people, the world, cannot see God. Their actions are the same as anyone else. God set aside his people to reveal his character through them. God has called his church to reveal his character. God has called you to reveal his character. What is God? What are the people seeing? I hope they see Christ. 
When you give to God what he, that he, what he is worthy of receiving, our very selves, we reveal to all who will see that God is great and his love is deep. They will see his love and recognize it as their deepest needs, but it has to be seen in us. So surrender everything to him and we will literally change our culture with his love. And finally, God seeks to show he is just and good. Let's look at verse 13. Your words have been arrogant against me, says the Lord, yet you say, what have, we spo- what have we spoken against you? You have said it is vain to serve God, and what profit is it that we have kept his charge and that we have walked in mourning before the Lord of hosts? So now we call the arrogant blessed. Not only are the doers of wickedness built up, but they also test God and escape. September 2013, there was a man in Brazil. He developed what doctors called pathological generosity. In an article published in the Journal of Neuroscience, doctors described the strange case of a 49-year-old man identified as Mr. A who had, made, who had a remarkable personality change after suffering a stroke. His physician said that after the stroke affected the subcortical regions of the man's brain, he suddenly had an excessive and persistent urge to help other people. He wouldn't stop giving money and gifts to people he barely knew. According to his wife, he would buy candy, soda, and food for kids he met on the street. He was also quit his job as manager of a large corporation. Dr. Larry Goldstein, a neurologist at Duke University, said, although the observation of personality change is not that unusual, this particular one is apparently novel. What happened to this man physically? We are called to live by the power of the Spirit, knowing God is our provider. Let us all have pathological generosity and be generous with what God has given us because it belongs to Him. Is He not capable of providing for us? And I'm not just talking about resources we have, but the character of God's love flowing through us. I give you Jesus, world. (laughs) What, you know... When God led Israel through the desert, he promised them the promised land. As they were about to enter the land, he told them, when you get there and you grow your crops and you live in these houses and you have success, don't forget me. In in Deuteronomy 8, it says, then your heart will become proud and you will forget the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt. Otherwise, you may say in your heart, my power and the strength of my hand have made this well. Isn't that easy to do? I get some success. Oh, look at how good I am. Instead, we ought to say, look at how good God is and what he accomplished. It's tempting to think that what we have accomplished, God had nothing to do with it. Whatever we did, God gave us the mind and the ability to do it. God gave us the earth to work. Don't forget the Lord. He is the creator. Surrender. Number one, speak the truth of God. In Malachi's day, the people had a different theology of God. God was absent and did not care. God was not involved. He was silent and did not care how you lived. Live as you please. God doesn't judge the sinner and bless the righteous. This is what they believed. This is what they taught. This is what they said. This is what they revealed to all the world. Eat, drink, and be merry. For tomorrow you die. It doesn't matter. In their eyes, to make God your priority, it did nothing for them. What does it profit to us, they asked, to follow after God? It's the vanity of vanities to follow him. In reality, this is the cultural message of today, isn't it? God is not silent. He's just absent. The people whom God called arrogant said, not only are the doers of wickedness built up, but they also test God and escape. Let us look at those who are testing us, those who do not fear God but are blessed anyway. It's easy to take our eyes off of Christ to see all these people living as they choose. And instead, we, we sometimes are tempted to think, well, strike them down, God. And said, Lord, show your love to them. Overcome them with your love. Change their heart. And when you take your eyes off of Christ, you can stand on the water like Peter and do, and do what he did. He begins to sink. And when he sank, he cried out to God. But as we sink, we go down into that murky water of the cultural message. And then we can't shake the so-called rational thinking and the web of its lies. And we're paralyzed. And we forget the word that God has spoken. As we look away, we see the proof, these words, and we again tend to believe the message of the culture. What is the foundation of these words, these words that the culture preaches? Doubt and unbelief. I doubt you're able to do what you say, God. I doubt you. You're not trustworthy. You're not able. You're not just. Now, doubt is the message you declare, and the world does not see Christ. 
He sees doubt. If what we read in these verses are true about God and the people of God were right in what they said, then the world is as it should be. What's wrong with the world? Their, 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 their world was, as we know it, is good, and there's no need to change it. What you think is bad is not bad, but I'm here to tell you I have a better message. I have a greater message. Jesus Christ is Lord. When the message of the world is heard and believed, God's love is hidden when we believe the message of the world. I challenge us to stand against the message of the culture and to declare with all boldness, God loves you. He sent his son to die on the cross for you. He is risen. He is Lord. He's forgiven you of your sins. Follow him. Listen to him. Surrender your life to him. Obey him. And the world will be blessed. And God will provide. Let's pray. Father God, thank you for your word. Thank you for your truth. Thank you that you love us, that you never leave us nor forsake us. For you are good. In Jesus' name, amen.